GOP rival former President Trump confined to the courtroom stops at a Manhattan bodega to highlight crime in Manhattan after his second day of trial. Supreme Court justices questioned whether federal prosecutors went too far in bringing charges against January 6th defendants. Their decision could have major implications, including for former President Trump. The House delivers impeachment articles to the Senate against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. And Speaker Mike Johnson lays out his new strategy for military aid to foreign nations. A Boeing whistleblower says a fatal flaw in a Boeing jet could cause it to break apart midair. Claims that Boeing denies more on the allegations and testimony before Congress today. Global property insurers see alarming losses. Property insurers have suffered three years of underwriting losses in the past four years. That and more with the host of Business Matters. Do you or your kids vape? A new study finds it leads to a much bigger risk of heart failure. How to avoid this health problem? A cardiologist's answer. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Hello there and welcome to NTD. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, April 17th. You know, Evelyn, this quest to provide foreign aid is said to be the trickiest part of Johnson's speakership. Right. He definitely has to navigate the complexities of the GOP conference. And we shall see what kind of aid uh, will pass the House, if any. Yeah, and whatever does goes to the Senate. And Johnson's also reportedly considering plans to seize Russian assets mm -hmm. and even turn some of the aid into loans. Imagine that. Right. So topping the news, House GOP leaders are laying out their new strategy to address President Biden's military aid request. And House Republicans yesterday delivered articles of impeachment to the Senate for DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more. A historic day in Congress for the 22nd time in U.S. history. Articles of impeachment have been delivered to the Senate floor. This time, two articles of impeachment against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. The next step is on Wednesday, senators will be sworn in as jurors and Senator Perry Murray, the Democrat from Washington, will preside over the impeachment proceedings. Now, it is expected that Democrats will immediately move to dismiss the impeachment trial. Let's listen to what Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell had to say about this strategy. It would be beneath the Senate's dignity to shrug off our clear responsibility and fail to give the charges we'll hear today the thorough consideration they deserve. Democrats would only need a simple majority to move to dismiss the trial, but there's at least three Democratic senators and three Republican senators who have been noncommittal on a motion to dismiss an impeachment trial. Now, on the House of Representatives, Speaker Mike Johnson has called himself a wartime speaker. He said he would not resign his position and that we're in the middle of a civilizational struggle for which his foreign aid plan is the best, best path forward. Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled his uh, plan for supplemental aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. He was going to present four separate bills on the House floor, one for each of these three countries and a fourth one uh, that would highlight Republican priorities. Now, let's listen to what uh, Chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Bob Good, had to say about uh, this new plan from Speaker Johnson. Speaker just announced that border would be not germane to the bills, so we're, we're not, not going to allow border security to be part of the package. That's a big, big problem. So Chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Bob Good, said that he would vote against this plan of four separate bills because they do not prioritize border security. Also, Republican Tom Massey has expressed that he would support the motion presented over three weeks ago by Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene to oust Speaker Johnson. Let's listen to what Representative Tom Massey had to say about this. Because the motion is going to get called, okay? Does anybody doubt that? The motion will get called, and then He's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy. If the motion to oust Speaker Johnson is brought up in the House floor, Democrats could simply move to dismiss the motion and save Speaker Johnson. But Representative Tom Massey has said that the ball is on Speaker Johnson's court and the future of the speakership is on his hands. Back to you. 
Let's unpack the House's attempt to send out foreign aid with Sumantra Maitra, the director of the American Ideas Institute and an editor at the American Conservative. Sumantra, thank you for being here right now at this critical time for the world. Speaker Johnson is breaking up the aid package into four separate votes. What are the possibilities here? Could the House choose to send aid to Israel and not Ukraine? The House has already decided to send aid to Israel in a previous package. It was already decided to go on a separate package for Israel. It just, the Speaker Johnson didn't have the courage to take it forward. Um, one of the things that he wanted to do this time is he calculated his position in the House GOP and thought it was prudent to bring up separate packages for both Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and uh, the border. But the border package didn't come, obviously, as you know. Uh, I think he calculates that he can thread the needle of, you know, the difference of opinion between the Republicans. But what he hasn't calculated is the opposition from the Democrat side, for example. So if the, if the Republicans agree that there should be a separate aid package for Taiwan and Israel that can go forward without the Ukraine one, it's the exact reverse on the Democrat side. For example, the Progressive Caucus doesn't want uh, a, a separate Israel package. So I think he is facing a tricky situation there. I think if it goes to floor vote, individual packages might pass, but I highly doubt that it would. So Mantra, this is definitely a balancing act for Speaker Johnson, and the House has been struggling to get this aid out for a while now as tensions overseas rise with Israel poised to strike back at Iran and a warm weather offensive from Russia is putting more pressure on Ukraine. What do we expect conservative representatives to do knowing that they have been vehemently opposed to sending U.S. tax dollars to Ukraine? Right. I mean, there's a perfect reason for that. So the conservative opposition to Ukraine and support for Israel is predicated on fundamentally two different things. One, Ukraine is not a treaty ally to the United States. Israel is. Like, there are treaties with Israel for, for uh, collective defense. Second, Israel and the U.S. have got tech transfers. For example, we do technological research with them, uh, especially when it comes to iron domes. But also the third and most important point is Ukraine is surrounded by treaty allies or non-treaty allies, or at least rich European countries which are aligned with us, right? So they can, if they want to, take up more burden when it comes to Ukrainian aid. We don't have to directly pay the money and the material. Europe can pay that. So that is a fundamental point in conservative opposition to Ukraine. They were like, you know, we are taking too much burden in all the spares, but at least in this fair, we have got allies who are rich enough to take the burden. Israel, on the other hand, is not such a case. Like, Israel is surrounded by Egypt and Syria. Obviously, they're not going to help Israel against Iran. So that is a tricky situation. I think also, ideologically, the House Republicans are more aligned to Israel than Ukraine. Uh, and fundamentally, the base of the party has moved since 2016, since the election of Donald Trump. So I think the House, can, House Republicans, and especially the conservative leaders, have understood that, that that is a tricky situation. And they have to like kind of like thread the needle between their supporters in-house in their primaries and in their, you know, in their, in their Senate. And they're trying to do that. Whether Understood. they'd be successful is a different question. Right, and Johnson's aware that the world is watching the House to see what they do right now. What is the Senate working on, and could that look entirely different from the House's aid package? Yeah, I think the Senate has got this interesting idea. Every time the House passes something, the Senate kind of like throws it back to the House, like House is a junior member of the, of the polity. It's not supposed to be that way. Like the American political system is designed where the House and the Senate are fundamentally equal when it comes to the legal powers that's endowed to them. Uh, I think the House, I think the Senate didn't expect the House to pass the HB, uh, the previous bill, uh, uh, separate standalone bill for Israel. Uh, and they were kind of like blind and sidetracked by them. The sen senators on the Republican side, other than Senator Paul, uh, Senator Hawley, Senator Vance, uh, and a few others, uh, Senator Mike Lee, and a few others are fundamentally old Republican Party. So they are more pro-internationalist and pro, you know, foreign policy, uh, pro aid uh, to both Israel and Ukraine. I think they have a difference of opinion with the House and they're trying to balance that. But I think the House is fundamentally more aligned to the American people. Samantra Maitra, thank you so much for your analysis this morning. Thank you very much for having me. And seven jurors have made the cut and many more have been rejected as former President Trump's criminal trial in New York continues. Trump is accused of falsifying business records related to payments he made to an adult film actress ahead of the 2016 election. And now prosecutors just filed a, former request, a formal request to hold Trump in contempt of court. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards was at the courthouse. 
Tuesday marks the second day of the Trump criminal trial, and the search continues for 18 unbiased jurors. While many have been excused for admitting that they can't be fair and impartial, others have been excused for different reasons. Before the juror selection proceedings got underway, former President Trump gave a statement outside the courtroom. He railed against the judge and called the case election interference. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant. I didn't know. Marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you've been indicted over that? I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House because the guy can't put two sentences together. Dismissed juror Kara McGee told ABC News that she doesn't like Trump and she didn't approve of what he did as president. But in an interview with CNN, McGee said she thinks she was dismissed for a different reason. And I said the nature of my job would make it very difficult for me to be here from nine to five for at least six weeks and probably longer. McGee is just one of several jurors dismissed in the last two days as questioning of prospective jurors continues. Eight jurors were dismissed Tuesday morning for a variety of reasons, including that it would be too difficult to be fair and impartial and that it would be too much of a strain on their work. Attorneys on both sides asked a range of questions. Trump attorney Todd Blanche asked questions such as, are you aware that Trump is charged in other criminal cases? Most of the jurors in the courtroom raised their hands. Blanche also asked for their views on Trump. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass wanted to know whether jurors could look Trump in the eye and say he's guilty if the prosecution proves the case. Jurors in the room all said yes. And he told the jurors that they might not like some of the witnesses, noting that Michael Cohen had been convicted of lying to Congress. After the questioning of the first round of jurors was completed, attorneys reviewed the list and told the judge whom they wanted to dismiss for particular reasons. Prosecutors didn't challenge the first 12 jurors, but the defense challenged one juror's social media post that celebrated Trump's 2020 loss. The judge denied the challenge, saying he believes the juror who said she can be fair and impartial. On Tuesday morning before jurors arrived, the prosecution filed a motion to hold Trump in contempt of court for allegedly violating the gag order that prohibits Trump from making comments about almost everyone connected to the trial. Prosecutors argued that Trump had made a series of recent social media posts that targeted known witnesses. For example, they say Trump called Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags. The defense argued that Trump was responding to repeated attacks made by Cohen and Daniels. The judge has scheduled a hearing on the matter for next Tuesday. Many have admitted that they are biased. Others say that they will judge this case based on the facts and that their political views don't matter. Reporting from the criminal courthouse in Manhattan, Arlene Richards, NTD News. Trump made a campaign stop at a bodega in Manhattan after court yesterday, the site of a violent stabbing attack. Trump aides said he chose the convenience store because it highlights public criticism against Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Supporters chanting four more years greeted Trump. The presumptive GOP nominee compared his prosecution to what happens on New York streets. Trump accused the DA of letting criminals go free. He said if Bragg wants law and order, he should stop the crime affecting New York businesses. Bragg's office reacted by stating the Bodega case was resolved almost two years ago, with charges against the clerk dismissed after a thorough investigation. Trump is set to meet for dinner with Polish President Andrzej Duda today in New York. Here's Trump at the bodega yesterday on his idea of an ideal juror. Anybody that's fair. Do you believe I'll let you know after, after the trial. There shouldn't be a gag order. Let me just tell you. The gag order is totally unconstitutional. The judge should not be there. The judge is highly conflicted. He should not be there. While Trump was in court, President Biden campaigning in the largest battleground state, Pennsylvania. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more from Scranton. 
And President Biden launching his three-day campaign swing here in the battleground state of Pennsylvania with a visit to his childhood hometown in Scranton. Where we come from matters. Touting his working class roots, President Biden argues that he's a candidate for the little guy, while Trump is for the wealthy. He looks at the economy from Mar-a-Lago, where he and his rich friends embrace the failed trickle-down policies. Scranton values or Mar-a-Lago values. These are the competing visions for our economy. Specifically, Biden's vowing to make wealthy Americans pay more in taxes and through that contrast his tax policy with Trump's. His failure starts with his $2 trillion tax cut that overwhelmingly benefited the wealthiest and biggest corporations. But Trump has said his tax cuts for both corporations and individuals contributed to the economic growth in 2018 and 2019. And Trump also accused Biden of trying to raise taxes for average Americans when campaigning here in Pennsylvania just last weekend. You like the fact that I got you the largest tax cut in the history of our country? And they're going to raise your taxes by four times, four times. Think of that. Meanwhile, President Biden has insisted that he would not raise taxes for any Americans making less than $400,000. And next up, Biden will be campaigning in Pittsburgh on Wednesday and in Philadelphia on Thursday. Also highlight the importance of this battleground state, which Biden's campaign says plays a key role to Biden's re-election bid. Reporting from Scranton, Pennsylvania, Iris Tao, NTD News. Supreme Court justices questioned whether federal prosecutors went too far in bringing charges against January 6th defendants. Their ruling over the application of a broad law could have ramifications for hundreds of convictions, and even former President Trump. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the details. The justices on Tuesday heard arguments in the case of Joseph Fisher. He's a former Pennsylvania police officer indicted for allegedly disrupting the certification of Biden's 2020 election victory. The alleged crime in question violating a 2002 federal law that prohibits the obstruction of an official proceeding. <laughs> Roughly 170 January 6th defendants have been convicted under the same act, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years. The Supreme Court will consider whether the interpretation of the law by prosecutors can be used against January 6th defendants and whether the convictions already secured will stick. After more than 90 minutes of arguments, it was not clear where the court would land in Fisher's case. Fisher's lawyer argued for a narrow application of the obstruction charge. He said that the Justice Department misapplied the law in this case. Conservative Justices Samuel Alito and Neil Gorsuch appeared most likely to take his side. Justice Gorsuch spoke about how a broad interpretation of the law could cover numerous other actions, including nonviolent protests. Justice Alito noted that many protests have erupted within the Supreme Court, but the Justice Department has yet to charge any protesters with a single day in prison. Liberal Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor seemed more favorable to the prosecution. Justices Amy Coney Barrett and Katanji Brown Jackson appeared to want a middle ground that might make it harder, but not impossible to use the obstruction charge. The Supreme Court's decision in this case could also have significant ramifications for former President Trump. He was charged with the same offense in 2023. Special Counsel Jack Smith accused him of corruptly obstructing an official proceeding by attempting to remain in power after the 2020 election. A Supreme Court ruling dismissing the charge against Fisher could make the case against Trump much weaker. The court's decision is expected by July. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Bob Graham, former U.S. Senator and two-term Democratic governor for the state of Florida, has passed away at the age of 87. Graham spent nearly 40 years in politics. He first served in Florida State House, then moved into the governor's mansion in 1978. Graham then went to Washington to serve in the Senate. He entered the 2004 presidential bid to become the, to become the Democratic nominee, but ultimately dropped out of the race. Graham was most known for his work days, which consisted of working alongside some of his constituents. Those jobs ranged from construction worker to bellhop to lobster fisherman. Graham is survived by his wife and four daughters, which include former U.S. Representative Gwendolyn Graham. 
And coming up, the U.S. planning to impose new sanctions on Iran after its attack on Israel last weekend. And Israel's foreign minister declares a diplomatic counterattack alongside Israel's military response. And Google employees join Gaza protesters in California, Seattle, and New York. They demand the tech giant end its cloud contract with Israel. The deal named Project Nimbus is sparking workplace controversy. Columbia University will face questions from House Republicans over its treatment of anti-Semitism on campus. It will be the fourth big school to do so.大地琴不仅仅是一件乐器它是有生命有感情的是要我们精心的照顾往往我们一个小小的动作可能都会对了情绪产生微妙的影响天音的品牌是福星我们对于传统的理念很荣幸被神韵艺术团选为指定供应商时间是酿造音色的不可替代的陪伴我跟大地琴已经有六十多年的友情了每一把琴都有他自己的个性熟悉它才能真正发挥它的潜力我希望给你的每一把琴都是首先我所信任的let me check the kitchen. Uh, there's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know. Let me, let me head upstairs. What do you see? What the? Did you shut this bathroom door? No. Oh, sh- What? Yeah, it's not here. What do you mean? The, the gun's not here. What? Cam! Cameron? Are you in there? Open the door! Cam! Please! Please! Open the door, Cameron! Come on, Cam. Good to have you back. The U.S. is planning to impose new sanctions on Iran after its large-scale attack on Israel last weekend. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the sanctions will take effect in the coming days. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is warning of economic spillover from Iran's threat to the region. Yellen said the new sanctions will be used to disrupt Iran's malign and destabilizing activity. Entities Jeremy Sandberg has more on the aftermath of Iran's attack. We do not want to see further escalation of the conflict. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller says Israel has not told the U.S. of plans to respond to Iran's weekend attack. Not we have been in close communication with them, uh, as well as other partners in the region over the past few days. The secretary has continued his consultations. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Tuesday, the U.S. will impose new sanctions on Iran in the coming days. Sullivan says the sanctions aim to contain and degrade Iran's military and target missile and drone programs. He said the U.S. anticipates allies to impose their own sanctions soon. 
Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned of economic spillovers from Iran's threat to regional stability. A Hebrew University poll released Tuesday had just under three quarters of respondents against retaliation strikes on Iran if it undermines Israel's security alliance with allies. Meanwhile, Israel's foreign minister declared he's leading a diplomatic offensive against Iran alongside a military response. He said on X he sent letters to 32 countries and spoke with counterparts, urging them to sanction Iran's missile program and designate Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist organization. Britain's prime minister says the group of seven are working on coordinated measures against Iran. Iran's leader is threatening a severe, extensive and painful response to the smallest action against Iran's interests. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And joining us now for analysis on the tense situation is Michael Pregent. He is a Middle East analyst at the Hudson Institute. Good morning, Thank Michael. You. Good to see you. So, Good morning. Um, Israel's War Cabinet was holding its fifth meeting on how to respond. So what do you think Israel's strategic objective will be uh, regarding Iran? Well, thank you for having me. As you can see, it's a multifaceted approach, right? They're pushing for sanctions on the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. They're trying to build a coalition. And they're also uh, signaling to the U.S. and to Iran that they can conduct an attack at a time of their choosing, right? So I do believe that Israel has to respond. Uh, this cannot be the new red line. Iran cannot launch ballistic missiles from its territory towards Israel over population centers and have that go unanswered. My concern, uh, because the administration continues to put sanctions on Iran, but then they don't enforce them. So my, my um, biggest concern is that there will be more sanctions on Iran that won't be enforced. This administration is not enforcing sanctions on Iran's illegal sale of oil. It continues to issue waivers to Iran that allow it to be flush with cash. In, with respect to Iraq, $10 billion are now uh, in, the, in the Iranian uh, coffers. Of course, it's fungible, right? So there's $10 billion that will go towards oil and gas, and now the regime can use it to support groups like Hezbollah and others. Right. That's a very good point that you're making. And staying with Israel for one moment here, what risk? It sounds like it's all a very delicate balance. So what risk is Israel running if the retaliation is too strong versus if it was too weak? Well, my biggest concern, it's not Iran, actually. It's Hezbollah. So when Iran launches, uh, Israel has plenty of notice in order to intercept, especially when it comes to drones, right? An eight-hour flight time. Ballistic missiles, 12 minutes, but that's still enough time to respond. If Hezbollah conducts an attack in response to an Israeli attack on Iran, Israel has seconds to respond. Israel has been able to deter Hezbollah, been able to show Hezbollah what it could do if it wanted to. Um, so hopefully that stays in place uh, while Israel contemplates what to do about Iran. But I think the wild card is Hezbollah. Right. And Iran has already said that it would definitely react whatever comes from Israel. So what do you think is this? Will this be a tit for tat escal escalation now? Well, I think I think Iran, when they launched that attack, somehow believed that the Biden administration was going to be able to put enough pressure on Israel not to respond. And if that was the reason that they went as heavy handed as they went, because they were assured by the White House that there would be no response. And I think that's a, that's a mistake. Israel has to do something. And when Israel responds, even if Israel gave Iran three days notice, Iran would not be able to stop that attack. So Israel needs to hit hard against IRGC targets and simultaneously uh, send a message to Hezbollah not to get involved. And if that happens, if there is a hard strike against Iran, I do think that they'll find a way to back down. I do feel the way I do feel that they'll find a way to de-escalate. And part of those threats from Raisi and the Supreme Leader were towards Europe. If Europe uh, joined in these sanctions and joined in these designations against the IRGC, so Europe needs to know that you know when Iran makes a threat. An economy with $4 billion makes a threat that Europe shouldn't buckle. Europe shouldn't, you know, take a couple steps back. Europe should call their bluff in order to put pressure on this regime. That's the best way to, to make all of that is to make Iran feel not only economic pain, but fear that there could be a kinetic strike inside of Iran against IRGC targets. I see. Well, thank you so much for some really great insights. Michael Pregent, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. 
and dozens of Google employees and pro-Gaza protesters gathered outside Google's building in Sunnyvale, California yesterday. The group demanded Google drop its cloud contract with Israel's government, calling it, called it Project Nimbus. One Google software engineer from Seattle called the project a workplace safety and health concern. The more than $1 billion deal with Amazon Web Services aims to provide cloud services for Israel's military and public sector. The multi-year project is being rolled out in four phases. It was announced in 2021. Similar protests popped up at Google offices in Seattle and New York. And Columbia University officials will be questioned today by House Republicans over alleged anti-Semitism on campus. Columbia leadership was not present for a December hearing where the heads of several top universities were grilled over how they dealt with rising anti-Semitism. UPenn President Liz McGill resigned a few days after the hearing as students, faculty and donors called for her removal. Harvard's Claudine Gay followed after weathering a month of intense pressure. MIT President Sally Kornbluth found support from the university and managed to hold on to her job. Columbia has so far avoided the fray. The university released a statement saying it's committed to combating anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism on school campuses has been a big issue since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. Jewish campus organization Hillel International conducted a survey. It found over 60 percent of Jewish parents said their child eliminated at least one school from their application over concerns about anti-Semitism. Up next, a Boeing whistleblower says a fatal flaw in a Boeing jet could cause it to break apart mid-air, claims Boeing denies. More in the allegations and testimony before Congress today. A 400-year-old historic landmark in Copenhagen went up in flames yesterday. See the dramatic footage coming up. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Stay tuned to get two rolls of Alien Tape free. You wouldn't stick your mother-in-law on the wall, but you could. With Alien Tape, it just sticks. Just peel and stick to make anything stay in place quick. Brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better than Alien Tape. You wouldn't stick your fishbowl on a moving car, but you could with Alien Tape. The secret is nano stick technology that grabs and locks on to secure one side of the surface to the other. Alien Tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. Call or go online to get your first roll of Alien Tape for just $19.99, plus shipping and processing. But to make this deal really stick, we'll give you two more rolls absolutely free. You get three rolls of Alien Tape for one low price. Order now. To order, call 1-800-490-1364 or go to TryAlienTape.com. So call 1-800-490-1364 or order online at TryAlienTape.com. Chief Division Counsel and DOJ have approved a no-knock breach. We want the subject to be on display. Doing the walk of shame, full visual impact. Any questions? Are we becoming a police state? We don't need to have a crime. What we need is a person to look at. And then we go find out what crime you did. FBI! Our focus is shifting. Our main priority as a bureau is going to be domestic terrorism. It really paints anybody who's right of center. If you're a pro-life, pro-family Catholic, they define you as radical. These are anti-government. We have freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Violent extremists, and they must be dealt with. We can do anything we want. If you're buzzed and doing this,
make yourself feel okay to drive? ZWX. You're not okay to drive. Y G K L V W. Uh, regular you. Thanks for staying with us. A Boeing whistleblower says all 787 jets need to be grounded to allow safety checks. The Boeing engineer is set to testify before two Senate panels today. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more on the allegations. Boeing engineer Sam Salapour will testify before Congress on Wednesday about the safety worries he brought up in a complaint to the FAA earlier this year. The quality engineer believes there is an assembly flaw in the fuselage of the 787 Dreamliner, which could cause a catastrophic crash. Salapour addressed his concerns Tuesday on NBC Nightly News. I think it's as serious as I have ever seen in my lifetime. Salapour has worked for Boeing for 15 years. He said he was retaliated against for raising safety concerns and transferred to the 777 line in 2022. I'm at peace with myself because this is gonna save a lot of people's lives. Salapore's attorney says at least six other potential whistleblowers have approached her with similar safety concerns, but haven't agreed to testify. Not yet. I think some of them will come forward, but frankly, they're terrified. Another Boeing whistleblower, John Barnett, was found dead in his hotel parking lot in March. His death was ruled a suicide by the coroner. It occurred just before he was supposed to continue his deposition against Boeing. Barnett had accused Boeing of neglecting safety concerns. Boeing responded to the safety allegations in a statement saying, These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate. The issues raised have been subject to rigorous engineering examination under FAA oversight. They say the 787 has undergone stress tests for 165,000 cycles, even more than what's expected during its lifetime, and it never had any issues. United Airlines says it's feeling the impact of Boeing's ongoing problems. The carrier says it lost $200 million during the first three months of the year after Boeing was forced to ground its 737 MAX 9 jets for several weeks. United says its first quarter would have turned a profit if the grounding did not happen. The company recently lowered its expected number of new planes for this year because of delays from Boeing. They were supposed to get 101 new narrow body planes, but now they're only expecting 61. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a new bill into law yesterday affecting how objections to books in school districts are handled. People with no kids in a district will now be will now only be able to raise one objection per month. Parents with children in the district can still file unlimited objections. The law aims to deal with issues from a 2022 law allowing objections to books and schools. School staff have faced cha challenges as objections flood school districts. The governor's office says the new law aims to protect schools from activists trying to politicize the book review process. DeSantis says Florida's focus on core academic subjects and rejecting indoctrination in the classroom has made it a standard bearer for educational excellence. An Ohio judge yesterday temporarily blocked a law banning cross-sex surgeries and puberty blockers for minors. The lower court judge said the two minors and their families challenging the law would be permanently harmed if it takes effect on April 24th. The order will remain in place for two weeks or until a hearing on the family's motion for a longer term order blocking the law. The Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost says he is confident the law will be upheld. Ohio is one of at least 22 states that have passed laws restricting cross-sex procedures for minors. Tuesday's ruling comes a day after the U.S. Supreme Court allowed Idaho to enforce its ban while it appeals a lower court order blocking it. And over to Denmark, a fire ripped through one of Copenhagen's most famous landmarks yesterday. The fire is now under control. But the fire at the old stock exchange caused parts of the roof to collapse and the fire spread to several floors of the building. 
there have been no reports of casualties. Here's the story. Copenhagen firefighters received the emergency call Tuesday morning. One of the city's most historic buildings was engulfed in flames. We can also say that nearly half the building is destroyed by fire, and, and this is a very historic building built back in uh, 1620 by uh, King Christian IV. So it's a very historic building in Copenhagen and uh, a big part of the Danish inheritance. Everybody's safe. No, nobody's hurt in this fire. Uh, we have tried to rescue a lot of historic paintings that was inside the building and the historic furniture. The fire claimed the building's famous dragon spire. The flaming spire came crashing down to the ground next to a fire truck. Residents considered the building an important part of the city's culture and history. This building is such a hallmark of Copenhagen. It's such a you know interesting part of you know the city skyline here, and it, I think it means a lot to everyone basically. It's, it's sort of one of the most historical buildings that we have. This resident compared this fire to the devastating Notre Dame fire in Paris. I think it's uh, not to be too arrogant, but I think it's a little bit like the, we compare like to the fire in Notre Dame. It's a very high value building, so. Uh, it's very sad to experience. The building was undergoing renovation, and scaffolding made it difficult for firefighters to battle the flames effectively. The building's copper roof also trapped the flames' heat. Soldiers helped to cordon off streets and secure valuables. Several hundred pieces of art and artifacts, including paintings, mirrors, chandeliers, and timepieces, were saved by firefighters before flames destroyed most of the interior. Even passers-by reportedly pitched in and helped save valuables. It's not yet clear what caused the fire. Police say they will begin investigating as soon as they can gain access. Stay with us. Global property insurers see alarming losses. Property insurers have suffered three years of underwriting losses in the past four years. More on that coming up with the host of Business Matters. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain unmarked boxes. So your private matters, stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Yeah. Oh. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. All right, I'm at the house, and uh, I'm gonna head inside. Okay, come on, this door. I'm in the house. What do you see? Uh, let me check the den. Uh, there's nothing in the den. Let me check the kitchen. Uh, there's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know, let me, let me head upstairs. Did you shut this bathroom door? No. Oh, sh What? 
It's not here. What do you mean? The, the gun's not here. What? Where is it? Oh my god. What's going hey, on? Cam. Oh my god. What's Cameron, on? are you in there? Open the door. Cam, please. Please. Open the door, Cameron. Come on, Cam. Welcome back, everyone. We have NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma, with us right now to give us the latest updates from the financial world. So, Don, first of all, the White House is set to impose sanctions on Iran following its attack on Israel. What effect could that have on the global economy? Right. So let me start with this. Uh, yesterday, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen warned of potential uh, economic damage from what happened in the Middle East, uh, rising tensions over there. So uh, Yellen spoke out against uh, Iran's malign and destabilizing activity uh, in remarks uh, this week uh, ahead of meetings uh, of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. She says uh, Iran's weekend attack on Israel uh, underscores the importance of the Treasury's uh, work to use economic tools um, to counter Iran's uh, malign activity. And she added this quote that uh, from that uh, from this weekend's attack, uh, the, Houth uh, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea to uh, Iran's sanctions uh, actions uh, threaten threatening the st stability and could cause uh, economic uh, spillovers uh, w with those events happening. Uh, meanwhile, a uh, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also said Tuesday uh, that uh, coming U.S. sanctions could target Iran's missile and drone program and entities supporting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, and Iran's uh, defense military. So uh, a lot happening here. Yeah, and Don, let's bear in mind that the U.S. only has so many options because Iran's one of the most heavily sanctioned countries in the world. One option, though, is hitting these Chinese firms that buy Iranian oil with sanctions again but that risks angering Beijing. Let's move on here. What do you have about the state of property insurance over the last few years? Yeah, some um, not so good news here because uh, according to uh, uh, some firms, global property and casualty insurers saw uh, alarming losses in 2022. And this is, of course, as natural disasters and catastrophes mm -hmm. increased and, and risk models failed to keep up with these insurance firms. And this is according to a report from the consulting firm Capgemini. So, now, so global insured losses from natural catastrophes have been surpassing $100 billion annually in recent years. Uh, and this is driven higher by issues like, uh, you know, winter storms, for example. Uh, industry sources are seeing uh, increased building in risk areas as well. And this is a, a, a contributing factor uh, to the losses. Uh, in fact, the report said that property insurers have suffered three years of losses in the past four years. Uh, and mm -hmm. accurate risk prediction and pricing are becoming more increasingly challenging. Uh, of course, this would potentially lead to uh, insurability concerns. And the report gathered information from 18 insurance markets, including Britain, Hong Kong, India, uh, and the United States. Uh, through polling of insurance customers and interviews with insurance executives and underwriters. So it seems like uh, there's something uh, potentially not very good happening right now. Right. Yeah, definitely. Also, premiums have been up across the country here in the U.S. Hopefully, they'll come up with a better model soon. I have another uh, alarming trend here. There is more retirees going back to work. Why? Yeah, yeah. Let me talk to you guys about this. Uh, you're right. More and more retirees are enter entering the job market uh, and many more are expected to join them. So what's happening here is that the Pew Research Center found that Americans over 75 years old are the fastest growing age group in the workforce. And that's a bit stranger because uh, they have quadrupled in size since 1964 and forecasters expect that number to double in the next decade. And some retirees said the cost of living went up and they could no longer afford their medication for some, some people. And some researchers think that people are living longer and are healthier in their older age. Um, and plus there are more jobs available that are not labor intensive. Another possibility for this increase is uh, the hybrid and remote jobs, making it easier for Americans to continue working. And Don, I believe that is called unretiring. Some do it for emotional reasons. Don Ma, host of Entity Business Matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And coming up, do you or your kids vape? A new study finds that it leads to a much bigger risk of heart failure. How to avoid this health problem? Our cardiologists answer when we come back. 
when I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like it's gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt uh, uh, much better. I did feel, actually, an effect. And I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times. And so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then the second time, I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just, just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times. And wow, there was a big difference because suddenly I could feel why wow, I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. The tempting online world is encroaching on our campus. Is unplugging cables and confiscating phones the solution to protect our children? No, we just need a clean multimedia platform. Join Ganjing Campus to leverage premium channel features, professional development courses, and kindness event toolkits tailored for teachers. Build a truly positive and interactive classroom community. Foster a pure and delightful learning environment for children. What was the process of actually putting this all together? Many, many hours of finding the right camera angles and watching it. The first trouble started just after one o'clock. 45 pages, here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. His lawyers didn't have this no. video. The, the video we're watching right now his own lawyers did not no. have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. That could be considered exculpatory evidence. This doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. What we're after is the truth. Welcome back. One of the biggest marketing strategies of vaping is the claim that it's healthier than cigarettes, but vaping comes with its own set of problems. A study has found vaping leads to a big risk of heart failure. I wanted to find out more about this, so I spoke with cardiologist Dr. Fami Farah. Check it out. Yes, a uh, latest study that was published in the American College of Cardiology has shown that it can have detrimental impact on your heart and it can be a cause behind a particular type of heart failure. Yeah, that's a 19% higher risk of heart failure associated with vaping. We're seeing a lot of young people in their 20s, 30s having an increased risk of heart attacks. Could this be part of the reason? It's quite possible. Um, it, the rate is quite alarming. You know, as you mentioned, almost 20% increased rate of heart failure. And uh, yes, you're correct. Teenagers and adolescents are even now turning to vaping. And, you know, time will tell what kind of impact that generation is going to have because they're getting exposed to these chemicals so early on. So it is concerning. Yes. And the study's lead author says that as more of these studies are coming out, we're finding out that e-cigarettes are not as safe as people used to think. What advice do you have for parents? I would advise parents to talk to their uh, children, uh, you know, non-adult children, uh, like adolescents and teenagers who are being exposed to vaping, that it's not as benign as previously thought. And they should advise them and discourage them from these uh, usage. And what more about this study can you explain that, they, I mean, it had 175,000 people that they tested. 
That's correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, the study found uh, that the rate is higher uh, in a particular type of heart failure called HEF-PEF. So what that is, is, you know, heart is a pump and the pump, uh, you know, it, its job is to squeeze blood all day long. That's how it survives and functions. Um, so there's a particular type where the heart, is just, just as important as it is for it to squeeze, it's also important for it to be able to relax. And the particular type of heart failure we're talking about is impairment in that relaxation of the heart. So the heart is becoming stiffer, the muscle, and as a result, it's not able to relax as well. Uh, so that's called preserved preserved ejection fraction type heart failure. And that's the particular kind that's on the rise that's been associated with e-cigarette smoking. That is very alarming. And this American College of Cardiology study comes also as the Cardiometabolic Institute cites diabetes, hypertension, and obesity as other risk factors there too. So what are teens and young people facing right now with all of these combined? It, those risks are still there, of course. There's family history as well. And, you know, in our country, especially in the United States, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all of those are risk factors. And these teenagers, on top of those risks, uh, they're adding one more, which is e-cigarettes. So I, I, I do worry about that generation and what the long-term impact of it will be. Uh, it is concerning. Dr. Farah, in your view, what are some solutions to this problem? I think public education is very important uh, early on, you know, uh, sometimes we tend to think that young people are not as exposed, but that's not quite true. Studies have shown in the past that the impact of the damaging impact of hypertension, for example, it starts to ensue a lot earlier than we think at a microscopic level. and so. When we see young folks uh, turning to vaping and things like that, my advice would be for parents to get involved for media, like what we're doing right now to encourage public education and give the right information to the right people so that we can discourage our young folks from uh, being exposed to um, harmful things. Cardiologist Dr. Fami Farah, thank you so much for this important update. Thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely learning as we go with those new products. And after all, I remember last year also all these news coming out that there is lung disease involved with that. And, you know, after all, people are still smoking nicotine and, you know, there's chemicals in those things. So, yeah, you're yeah. putting something foreign in your body there is going to have those very bad effects. I mean, yeah. the names of these things are called Tropical Runts Punch. Blueberries, lushy, fried. You wonder who those marketers are going after. It's obviously kids. Absolutely. And the colorful packaging is definitely, yeah, it stands out. Right. All right, moving on to another story. A massive black hole has been spotted less than 2,000 light years away. This makes it the second closest known black hole to Earth. Astronomers discovered the so-called sleeping giant while combing through observations from European Space Agency's Gaia Space Telescope. They named it Gaia BH3. Gaia BH3 has a mass nearly 33 times greater than that of our sun. It's the largest known stellar black hole in the Milky Way galaxy. The closest black hole is Gaia BH1, located about 1,500 light years away. Its mass is not even 10 times that of our sun. 33 God. times all the things that are out there. Yeah, yeah. a couple of light years away. That's that's yeah. a little too close for comfort. Those black <laughs> holes, you know, they yeah. suck light in. Light can't even leave the event right. horizon. Oh, wonder what's inside. Must be a hell of a wormhole. Oh. <laughs> all right. Um, we are heading to the second part of our broadcast now. We'll be right back after a quick break. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD.
Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. The U.S. set to impose new sanctions on Iran after its weakened attack on Israel, and Israel's foreign minister declares a diplomatic counteroffensive alongside Israel's military response. Day two of former President Trump's criminal trial in New York. Why jurors want to be excused, plus why the prosecution wants Trump to be held in contempt of court. The report from outside the courtroom in Manhattan. Are secure borders necessary for public safety? A former NYPD detective weighs in on the impeachment of DHS Secretary Mayorkas and how the border crisis is complicating police work. Hawaii's AG is set to release a report on the devastating fires that hit Maui last year. This after the fire department released their own report calling for improvements to be better prepared. Security cameras can be a great tool for protecting your home, but we uncover a potential flaw that could render them useless when you need them most. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, and today's top news. The U.S. is planning to impose new sanctions on Iran after its large-scale attack on Israel last weekend. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the sanctions will take effect in the coming days. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is warning of economic spillover from Iran's threat to the region. Yellen said the new sanctions will be used to disrupt Iran's malign and destabilizing activity. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the aftermath of Iran's attack. We do not want to see further escalation of the conflict. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller says Israel has not told the U.S. of plans to respond to Iran's weekend attack. Not we have been in close communication with them, uh, as well as other partners in the region over the past few days. The secretary has continued his consultations. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Tuesday the U.S. will impose new sanctions on Iran in the coming days. Sullivan says the sanctions aim to contain and degrade Iran's military and target missile and drone programs. He said the U.S. anticipates allies to impose their own sanctions soon. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned of economic spillovers from Iran's threat to regional stability. A Hebrew University poll released Tuesday had just under three-quarters of respondents against retaliation strikes on Iran if it undermines Israel's security alliance with allies. Meanwhile, Israel's foreign minister declared he's leading a diplomatic offensive against Iran alongside a military response. He said on X he sent letters to 32 countries and spoke with counterparts, urging them to sanction Iran's missile program and designate Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist organization. Britain's prime minister says the group of seven are working on coordinated measures against Iran. Iran's leader is threatening a severe, extensive and painful response to the smallest action against Iran's interests. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. In domestic politics, House Republicans yesterday delivered articles of impeachment to the Senate. Our Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, has more. A historic day in Congress. For the 22nd time in U.S. history, articles of impeachment have been delivered to the Senate floor. This time, two articles of impeachment against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. The next step is on Wednesday, senators will be sworn in as jurors, and Senator Perry Murray, the Democrat from Washington, will preside over the impeachment proceedings. Now, it is expected that Democrats will immediately move to dismiss the impeachment trial. Let's listen to what Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell had to say about this strategy. It would be beneath the Senate's dignity to shrug off our clear responsibility and fail to give the charges we'll hear today the thorough consideration they deserve. Democrats would only need a simple majority to move to dismiss the trial, but there's at least three Democratic senators and three Republican senators who have been noncommittal on a motion to dismiss an impeachment trial. Back to you. We're going to address two topics with our next guest, the impeachment of DHS Secretary Mayorkas and a hearing by the House Oversight Subcommittee on National Security, the Border and Foreign Affairs. Please welcome Peter Forcelli. He's a retired NYPD homicide detective and retired ATF Deputy Assistant Director. Peter, thank you for being here. Let's start with your perspective first on the impeachment of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas now that the House has delivered the articles to the Senate, which is expected to dismiss them in a hurry. 
Sure. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Listen, I, to be honest, I'm surprised it's taken this long. Um, you know, look, I, I'm not affiliated with either party. You know, I'm an independent voter. Uh, I spent 20 plus years in federal law enforcement, and I'm familiar with the border. Um, the border is not secure. It has not been secure in some time. And I've seen uh, Mayorkas on many occasions sit there and state that they had operational control of the border, which was obviously a lie. So the fact that it's taken this long is somewhat perplexing to me. I think this should have happened a lot faster. If anyone cares about the security of our southern border or just national security in general, uh, they should put politics aside and move forward and have this hearing because the American public, they deserve to know what's happening down there. Like I said, it's astounding to me knowing the threats that are posed to this country, um, you know, from the southern border and beyond that, that this man has stated that he's had operational control so often, so many times in front of the American people and blatantly lied to them. It's, it's just it's offensive, frankly. Okay, let's talk about some discussions on Capitol Hill. Ken Cuccinelli, a senior fellow for Immigration and Homeland Security at the Center for Renewing America, pointed out that Biden's DHS is not having illegal immigrants deported even when they commit serious crimes, concluding that the administration intentionally wants the border open for their own reasons. What threat does that pose to the public? Well, a grave threat. And look, I think that's part of the reason why Mayorkas is still in this position is because he's doing exactly what they want him to do. When you look at what's happening with the gang, for example, in New York, Trend de Aragua, um, they were non-existent prior to what's going on in this current administration. You look at the fact that we have 294 known terrorists caught at the border since uh, 2021, you know, unheard of. Look, I'm a 9-11 survivor. It only took 19 people to do what they did on that particular day. Uh, I lost seven friends on that day. So I find this difficult to comprehend why we cannot secure our border. And it's not that we don't have the ability to do it. It's that the administration doesn't seem to want to do it. So it's concerning. I mean, you look at uh, the the mayor of New York City and the mayor of Chicago, we're currently saying, hey, enough is enough at this point, because they're even realizing this is not sustainable. Um, it's a public safety threat. Um, you look at the fentanyl that's coming across the border, tons and tons of fentanyl. We're losing the equivalent of an airplane crash a day in Americans who are dying of fentanyl poisoning because it's well known that the CCP is sending uh, fentanyl precursors to Mexico. In fact, I've learned that the the, uh, the companies that are making the fentanyl in China are subsidized by China with the caveat that they can't sell their products in China. So clearly this is intentional to get these products into the United States and not securing the border is just, it, it defies common sense. So sorry, Peter, that you had to go through those tragedies of losing your friends over this. What unique challenges does the combination of what some are calling open border policies and so-called sanctuary city policies create for law enforcement? Well, there's a number of problems. One is you have people coming into the country who don't understand our laws. You have people coming into the country who we don't know who they are. I mean, they're not in a database. They've, you know, they're criminals who haven't been arrested here. You know, as an investigator, we often relied on on photo books and, you know, uh, fingerprints that we would have fingerprints of criminals on file when people are coming into the country in mass and look not all folks coming here are criminals not all folks are coming here for the wrong reasons but many are it just represents many challenges the other thing i've seen that's unusual is how these folks tend to move from place to place like we saw that recent event where those new york city police officers were assaulted in times square the individuals involved quickly fled the state so they have this mobility that's not something that you see with local criminal threats that I've dealt with in my 35 years in law enforcement. Well, thank you so much for this extensive report. Peter Forcelli, retired NYPD homicide detective and retired ATF deputy assistant director. Have a good day, thank you. Seven jurors have made the cut and many more have been rejected as former President Trump's criminal trial in New York continues. Trump is accused of falsifying business records related to payments he made to an adult film actress ahead of the 2016 election. And now prosecutors just filed a formal request to hold Trump in contempt of court. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards was at the courthouse. Tuesday marks the second day of the Trump criminal trial, and the search continues for 18 unbiased jurors. While many have been excused for admitting that they can't be fair and impartial, others have been excused for different reasons. Before the juror selection proceedings got underway, former President Trump gave a statement outside the courtroom. He railed against the judge and called the case election interference. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who should be on this case. He's totally conflicted. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, 
I didn't know. Marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House because the guy can't put two sentences together. Dismissed juror Kara McGee told ABC News that she doesn't like Trump and she didn't approve of what he did as president. But in an interview with CNN, McGee said she thinks she was dismissed for a different reason. And I said the nature of my job would make it very difficult for me to be here from nine to five for at least six weeks and probably longer. McGee is just one of several jurors dismissed in the last two days as questioning of prospective jurors continues. Eight jurors were dismissed Tuesday morning for a variety of reasons, including that it would be too difficult to be fair and impartial, and that it would be too much of a strain on their work. Attorneys on both sides asked a range of questions. Trump attorney Todd Blanche asked questions such as, are you aware that Trump is charged in other criminal cases? Most of the jurors in the courtroom raised their hands. Blanche also asked for their views on Trump. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass wanted to know whether jurors could look Trump in the eye and say he's guilty if the prosecution proves the case. Jurors in the room all said yes. And he told the jurors that they might not like some of the witnesses, noting that Michael Cohen had been convicted of lying to Congress. After the questioning of the first round of jurors was completed, attorneys reviewed the list and told the judge whom they wanted to dismiss for particular reasons. Prosecutors didn't challenge the first 12 jurors, but the defense challenged one juror's social media post that celebrated Trump's 2020 loss. The judge denied the challenge, saying he believes the juror who said she can be fair and impartial. Reporting from the criminal courthouse in Manhattan, Arlene Richards, NTD News. Donald Trump is the first former president in U.S. history to go on trial for criminal charges. But a new poll by AP and the Nork Center for Public Affairs Research found only about one-third of U.S. adults think Trump committed a crime. Around a third of those surveyed said they thought Trump did something unethical but not illegal. Fourteen percent, though, thought that Trump did nothing wrong. The poll also shows if Trump were to be convicted, half felt he would be unfit for office, one-third said he would be fit for president, and around 20 percent said they don't know enough to say. Prosecutors accused Trump of falsifying business records to cover up payments to an adult film actress during the 2016 election cycle. The new poll found about half of Americans think Trump did something illegal in the other three criminal cases against him. Trump made a campaign stop at a bodega in Manhattan after court yesterday, the site of a violent stabbing attack. Trump aides said he chose the convenience store because it highlights public criticism against Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Supporters chanting, four more years, greeted Trump. The presumptive GOP nominee compared his prosecution to what happens on New York streets. Trump accused the DA of letting criminals go free. He said if Bragg wants law and order, he should stop the crime affecting New York businesses. Bragg's office reacted by stating the Bodega case was solved almost two years ago with charges against the clerk dismissed after a thorough investigation. Trump is set to meet for dinner with Polish President Andrzej Duda today in New York. Here's Trump at the Bodega yesterday on his idea of an ideal juror. Anybody that's fair. I'll let you know after after the trial. There shouldn't be a gag order. Let me just tell you, the gag order is totally unconstitutional. The judge should not be there. The judge is highly conflicted. He should not be there. Coming up, Hawaii's AG is set to release a report on the devastating fires that hit Maui last year. This after the fire department released their own report calling for improvements to be better prepared. And security cameras can be a great tool to protect your home. We uncover a potential flaw that could render them useless when you need them most. Butte, Montana residents were treated to a rare sight yesterday, a loose elephant roaming around. Hear the whole story coming up. Did you know indoor air quality can be five to even 100 times worse than outdoors? Meet the Air Doctor. 
It's your answer for clean air and the only hospital grade air purifier equipped with advanced ultra HEPA filters proven to improve your indoor air quality and overall health. Air Doctor circulates and triple filters the air in your room up to five times per hour. Say goodbye to pollen, smoke, mold spores, pet dander, even viruses, because the Ultra HEPA filter removes virtually 100% of dangerous contaminants down to 0.003 microns. That's 100 times smaller filtration than ordinary HEPA purifiers. This would have been in your lungs. Finally, get relief from allergies and asthma and reduce airborne disease. It's pulling the pollutants out. It's even pulling the toxic chemicals that our cleaning products leave behind. Call or go to tryairdoctor40.com now. Get 40% off our best-selling air purifier. Call 1-800-876-0163. Call now. Imagine a coffee that cares for your health. expertly fermented with a 50 enzyme complex to enhance flavor and remove bitterness. Small batch roasted to a decadent medium dark, resulting in a brew that is gentle on digestion, low acid, and up to 90% less caffeine than regular coffee. America's first enzyme fermented coffee today. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. It's all is good, it, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. Welcome back, everyone. Authorities in Hawaii this week are releasing an action report on the deadly Maui wildfires. The state's attorney general is set to issue the first phase of findings today. The report was conducted by the AG's office and the Fire Safety Research Institute. It will come a day after Maui fire officials release an after-action report regarding the August 2023 wildfires that devastated the town of Lahaina. This report said the Maui Fire Department was not prepared to fight fires of that scale. Officials say around 100 people lost their lives in the twin blazes. Department officials spoke to the press about the report on Tuesday. Uh, it's important to remember, on August 8th, we experienced not just the worst fire in state history, we experienced the two worst fires in state history, occurring at the same time on the same island. The report mentions how poorly stocked fire engines were. It describes one harrowing scenario in which fire hydrants began to lose water as firefighters were fighting the blaze. They did not know whether the water connections failed because of the size of the fire and the number of burning homes, or if water supply tanks were not filled because of a loss of electricity earlier that day. The report describes extreme measures firefighters took in rescue efforts, including sheltering survivors and their fire engines and evacuating people while their own houses were burning down. The report recommends the department keep backup vehicles ready during future emergencies. It says the engines on standby during the fire took up to an hour to deploy. Maui's fire chief said he was proud of the response, but also said the department identified various areas it could improve in. The first one's to fully stock our relief apparatus. Second's to create a statewide mutual aid program. Third is to create a communication plan to evacuate visitors and residents who speak different languages. 
The fire caused between four and six billion dollars in property damage. No official cause has been revealed yet. Well, yeah. sounds like they came up with uh, quite a few recommendations, which is good, and hopefully that will prevent anything that will be as disastrous as this or smaller too, of course. Yeah, especially considering that the cause is still unknown after all this time, mm -hmm. and the ATF is continuing to investigate and find out. Right. Don't know what the cause is, but that caused the deadliest wildfire in almost a century in the U.S. But nevertheless, you know, you got to give honor where honor is due. Those fire, uh, firefighters and first responders, they were faced with such an extreme situation and they faced lack of resources, lack of manpower. So, um, yeah, still. Yeah, and to your point, 101 people at least were killed in this fire. And that's right. just such a tragedy. But we did see some of the best of humanity, people really stepping up and helping others out under all that duress. Right, and up, to the, uh, up until this day, right, because the community still is struggling to rebuild. There is a lot of challenges they're facing. They're working hard to rebuild their community, though, and, um, you know, trying to stay, uh, keep the community intact and fight off some of the developers, I think. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. those Hawaiians are resilient people, as we have seen. Right. Um, nevertheless, we are now moving on to a different uh, story that you should pay attention to because security cameras can be a great tool in protecting your home, but some of the wireless ones could have a safety flaw. Hackers and criminals could potentially access and disable your cameras. Entity's Bill Thomas has the details. Hardwire security camera systems for home use were standard practice for many years, but many of us have made that switch over to Wi-Fi. However, in a rapidly changing high-tech world, are these Wi-Fi systems the best bet for home security? Well, they're certainly affordable, but they could leave you in a very vulnerable position. I have a Wi-Fi camera. It's wireless. It's a lot easier to maintain. It's less messy because you don't have to use wires. It just feels more modern. It looks good. Yeah, it is wireless. I think it's more convenient, you know, uh, wireless instead of the uh, wire. We've all been using the convenience of Wi-Fi in our homes for a variety of reasons since the late 1990s. And now more and more people are adding Wi-Fi security cameras to their homes for both safety and protection. Unfortunately, there's a device called a Wi-Fi jammer, and in the wrong hands, use of one of these devices can have disastrous results. According to a report by the Glendale Police Department in California, thieves are using these jammers to interfere with home security cameras and alarms, disabling those devices, which then enables thieves to commit home burglaries without being detected. In Detroit, something similar to a Wi-Fi jammer is being used, and it's called a deauthor. A deauthor essentially tricks your Wi-Fi system into disconnecting from your router, which means you won't receive electronic notifications if someone is breaking into your home. While both types of devices may be illegal in your area, they can easily be found with a simple internet search, making them accessible for anyone to purchase and use. Sales of these Wi-Fi jammers can't be stopped right now, but there are a few things you can do to better prepare yourself from these high-tech breaches, according to the Glendale Police Department. First, it's recommended that you hardwire your security system, as these Wi-Fi jammers and deauthors only work on wireless systems. If you can't immediately switch from Wi-Fi to a hardwire system, try putting your main security equipment in the center of your home as that makes it more difficult for criminals to hack your system. Also, it's a good idea to back up your security system with multiple hard drives and think about storing all of your data on the cloud of your choice. For an extra added measure of safety, don't forget to install backup batteries to your security system to ensure more continuous operation during power outages or other disruptions. Finally, it's a good idea to keep your home well lit, keep all windows and doors locked, be cautious of impersonators, and it helps to have a good neighbor or house sitter to watch your home when you're away. Bill Thomas, NTD News, Los Angeles. Great report from Bill. Definitely good tips, but it's shocking how easy it is to get those Wi-Fi jammers. Oh, man, I know. Yeah, and well, CNET says that you can protect your security cameras with a couple tips. They say go with the reputable manufacturers mm -hmm. and also get this uh, high-end, end-to-end encryption. That's mm, probably something you need. Well, yeah, that's a good point. And like Bill says, right, I think at least one case in Phoenix by having, you know, wired security cameras and wired Internet, they were able to f uh, fend off some of those intruders. Well, they didn't even attempt because they realized that none of the system was down, you know, and sometimes a red light to keep just the red light on on the camera might be worth quite a bit because then it looks like it's still recording. And imagine not having even a landline or being not being able to call anybody and everything is down. That's scary. That's a scary situation. Well, you know, and you're right about that little red light. The, the simplest yeah. things can deter criminals. It's just like those lights that pop on 
run from the motion sensor, it can spook them. So, and you also want to make sure True. you get those tough passwords on there. True. Yeah. Don't forget those. No ABC one, two, threes. All right. Before we wrap up our show, here is something you don't see every day. Locks of folds, locks of folds in Butte, Montana could be, couldn't believe what they saw yesterday. A circus elephant got loose and was wandering the streets. This photo shows the pachyderm eating grass behind a business. It's a big boy. Yeah. The manager at the Butte Civic Center, where the circus was taking place, says the elephant was getting ready for a show when it got spooked by a vehicle. Oh, yeah. That's if it's a male. That is. That's when the elephant named Viola took off. Well, but she doesn't get far. She only walked about half a block before the elephant's handlers corralled her and put her back into the trailer. Well, at least no injuries were reported. Yeah, and according to reports, handlers were able to handle it without having to call law enforcement. Whew. Yeah, Poor you don't want to get a little uh, stampede going on there in Montana. <laughs> Poor girl, city life must be scary though. Oh, yeah. All right, we are wrapping up our show right here, but be sure to stay tuned for Entities News Today, broadcast at 10 a.m. Eastern Time that's coming up. Yeah, and for round the clock original news coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our Entity app. That's right, thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.